Hi everyone, I hope you're keeping well. It's John Weecroft here again with another Sunday Q&A. We're up to week number 36 and I've had some great questions once again. I'm going to do a little bit of a follow-up to some of the stuff I was looking at last week. We were looking at my horizon, so I'm going to do a development of that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about picking repertoire that you can use that's going to stretch you technically, but it's also going to keep you hopefully inspired to keep practicing. So the pieces that you pick when you're practicing, the tunes to learn, you can use them for much more than just repertoire. You can use them as ways of maintaining or developing technique, uh, improvisational ideas, you know, getting new kind of conceptual, uh, compositional, whatever. You, you can use them for pretty much um, fuel for almost every area of your playing. So you should choose them wisely. Uh, I'm also going to look at some speed cheats, some uh, technical things that you can use to break certain barriers when it comes to progressing uh, with the metronome, making things quicker. There's some uh, kind of in-between techniques, shall we say, that merge more than one idea. So if you're someone that thinks of legato and staccato as two independent and separate things, then this might be interesting for you because you can kind of mix both feels. You can mix things that are all picked with stuff that's got more hammer-ons and pull-offs in to create uh, an approach that's technically possible to play things pretty quickly. And also because you've got these micro rests, it allows you to keep, uh, to keep an idea going. It's really good for stamina, it's good for articulation and so on. And it's used by a surprising amount of players actually. If you're someone that thinks you're either a player that picks everything or a player that hammers and pulls most things, well you may be surprised to find that a lot of the world's greatest players are somewhere in the middle. So we'll be looking at that. So as always, there's a piece for you. So I'm gonna play the perennial jazz standard, The Days of Wine and Roses. And I always like to have a little bit of a theme with these things. So this week's theme, is just gonna be guitar and bass. There's no rhythm part at all. And that allows me to play a lot more like chord melody. I'm trying to, in this instance, I'm gonna to try to mix the two so that the two are not two separate things. It's not like you play the rhythm and then you play a solo. In this instance, I'm gonna try and blend the two together. So as usual, I'm gonna do three takes and pick the best one. I'll see you on the other side of the chin. I hope you enjoy this. <laughs>
let's begin this week by recapping some of the material we did last week, uh, where we looked at Pat Martino's method for juxtaposing minor phrases against all the other different types of harmony that you might find in this style of music. So first, of course, I need to acknowledge the great Pat Martino. So this is definitely his system, and I would urge you to check out his instructional material. It's really great. There's such a lot to be learned from him, but hopefully I'll be able to give you at least a brief insight, and it might direct you to Pat. Uh, you definitely won't be disappointed. He's, he's one of the greats, so he's one to be checked out, I would say. Okay, so to be, to be clear, let's recap by starting with an E Dorian phrase. So that's a really, really short phrase in the key of E Dorian coming from D major. So we go root, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth. So in this instance, there isn't really any like chromaticism going on. But of course we can always add it, but I just want us to have very very short phrase that we can all get our fingers around so I can use this as a teaching device of course when we use these things in practice I want you to kind of play around and find your own phrases extend them modify them change them do whatever you will okay, so that's our phrase Close them here. find that anywhere that you can find that okay. so against an E minor we're going to play naturally in E minor. So I've chosen E here so that I can just play an E drone and you can hear that sound against it. Okay. So we also looked at if it were E7, what we think of, we think of that as being like a B minor 7, B minor 6 transition over E. So we think a fifth above, and we play our same phrase, this time not in E, but in B. So that's the exact same phrase, transposed now to the key of B. Okay, so that's a fifth away. Okay, so for major sevens, we think of this as being like E Lydian is the relative major of C sharp Dorian. The color tone there equals the raised four, 11. So in this instance, I think C sharp. So think of the sixth. Okay, for E half diminished, we think of this it's like a G minor over E. There's our G minor. G minor. So then we go. A minor third above. So for half diminished, we think off the flat three. Okay. And for altered dominant, we think a semitone above. So we think in this case F. That's going to be slightly tense. dominants are slightly tense that's the whole point of them okay so just to recap so we've got the the calculations if you like for minor we think off the roots for D minor for E7 we think off the fifth so that's going to be B minor for E major or E Lydian we think off the sixth of the sixth degree, but E half diminished, we think of this as being G minor, G minor 
minor six with the sixth in the bass. So you think up the minor third. And for E altered, think of it as being kind of like F minor over E, the altered scale. So we weight this more towards melodic minor, although Dorian will sound fine too. It just makes it sound like we've got a major seven resolving to the root, which is a great form of tension and release. That's F. So if this is news to you, I suggest you go back and re you review last week's uh, session where we looked at this in depth. But they're the calculations. Uh, as I say, review last week. Obviously check out Pat Martino's material as well and that'll put you in a good place. But that's where we're going to begin this week. And we're back. I hope you don't mind the change of scenery, but uh, we have builders in next door, so there's a lot of banging and drilling going on. So this is the only way really I could continue. So I hope this isn't too off-putting, but uh, we'll try this different location for the rest of today. Okay, so where we were so far, we were looking at this phrase. That was it, wasn't it? That was the phrase have to be this one of course I'm just using this as a teaching device and we said that would be E minor E E7 E major E half diminished and E altered Now is we're going to juxtapose those same phrases against a 2-5-1 chord progression. So we begin with a minor 2-5-1 chord progression. We do this in the key of D to allow us to use some open strings. E, A, D minor. So the 2-5-1, just so that we're sure what that is, is E minor 7 flat 5, A7, D minor. Now the way that Pat would think of this is for the E half diminished, he thinks G, as we've discussed before. For the A7, see this is A altered, we get now B flat. And then for D minor, D, naturally. So I'll play this with the open strings, I'll play here. Making sense? So he's thinking of it as being, instead of it being an E half diminished thing, followed by an A7 thing, followed by a D minor thing, which is three completely different types of chords, he thinks of it as being number one, G minor, number two, B flat minor, chord three, D minor. So it's G, B flat, D, all minors. So of course I'm using this phrase. But you can play whatever you want, you know. So forth. So that's how we think, or one way we can think against minor, we can think of it as being upper minor third, upper major third. So that's what we're doing here. So we're thinking G against E half diminished, B flat against A7, D naturally against D. Now we can do the exact same thing against uh, major 2 5 1. So now we have two choices here. Right, so one of them is to maintain that minor third, major third move. And then we end up with an, an, an unusual scenario where we're playing Phrygian mode against the dominant seven. But let's go for the more conventional route first. Okay, so if this were major, we could play E minor against E minor chord. Like so. Okay, so there we have E minor against E. A, B flat, and then for our D, we have B. Okay, so our choices there are E minor against.
against um, against D, of course. Okay. Then we've got the option of, in this instance, playing B flat. So that's the way we can minorize against major. So let's do this in a, a slower way. Slow back, slow down a little here. So for minor, E half diminished, we could play G against our A seven altered, we could play B flat, and then against our D minor, we play. Major form against E, we play E. Okay, and then over our A7, we can play B flat. And then against our D major, we play B. Okay, so that's an option. Okay, we have a further option here where we can keep this same concept of moving a minor third and a major third. Away, where against E minor we play E minor, then against our A7 we play G minor. What that does is that produces a kind of a hidden altered sound. What we're getting here now is Phrygian mode. doing is we're repurposing the notes so in this way what we get is root flat nine raise nine four five raise five so that kind of sound and then of course that gives us e minor against e minor g minor against a seven and then again we go up a major third for B minor against our D. Hope that makes sense. Now that's less common, but it's definitely still used. You know, you'll definitely hear those kind of phrases. Playing Phrygian mode. So Phrygian can be seen in many instances as an option that you could use against the dominant seven chord. So that's probably not one that you maybe have seen before, because we're obviously we're told the Phrygian mode is used in these situations where you know you're playing kind of a like a Spanish minor type sound. But in a lot of instances in jazz, it's used predominantly over a dominant seven chord, like for example, the tune. That there. That. That's Phrygian mode. Clear use of Phrygian mode without the major third against a dominant seven, because in the tune Blue Boss it goes two, da, 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 five. It doesn't go should be the Phrygian dominant, it goes. So in this instance, the minor third is functioning as a raised nine. So that's going to be a way to approach minorizing with those lines. So we have the idea of upper minor third and upper major third. And you can do this with any phrase, of course. I'm only using this phrase as a teaching device. One of the things that I wanted to talk about this week was about using pieces to work on technique. So you can work on technique just in a purely exercise-based way. In fact, we're going to look at some exercises in a moment based around picking ideas. But another way of doing the same thing is to take a little leaf from our classical counterparts book, where what they will often do is they won't necessarily practice technique in the form of just specific exercises, but they'll just take little small pieces 
from the more complete pieces that they're working on uh, as the basis of their repertoire. So we can do the same exact thing. So one of the things that I've been doing in recent years when I work on technique is it's much more fun and more engaging to actually play real music. I guess it's one of the advantages of lockdown where if we're not preparing for gigs, then you can now use this as a way of taking all the pieces that you've always just wanted to learn how to play just because you want to learn how to play them. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that specific goal in mind, like you need to learn it for a gig. So what I've been doing is taking things that I find challenging and stretching, and I use them as like little etudes rather than working on scales and arpeggios and all that other stuff. So I've been working on Rhythm Future, the Django piece. I may have mentioned this the other week. In fact, I've recorded Django's waltz as one of the tunes in these Q&A sessions. The only reason I was practicing that tune was because it was a great way of working on technique and uh, increasing the speed on the metronome. I've been playing a bluegrass standard in preparation for some other stuff that I'm doing, um, Blackberry Blossom. And just for fun with technique practice is just see how fast I can take it on the metronome. You know, can I get it up there into the 200s, 250s, 300s even? You could take, you know, if you're a jazz player, then any Charlie Parker head. There's millions of them, you know, learn Donna Lee, learn Confirmation, figure out uh, you know, any of those tunes, you know, figure out Scrapple from the Apple. You know, it's not easy. You know, those, those licks are not necessarily so easy. Um, it could be you could take something from the classical canon. You know, one of the things that I use as a teaching device is uh, perpetual motion, the Paganini thing. You don't necessarily need to learn the whole thing as well. The first four bars serves as an amazing workout for uh, alternate picking or whatever it is that you happen to be using at any given time. You know? So it's helpful if you pick things that you really, really like the sound of and that are going to keep you engaged from a kind of musical perspective rather than just doing things where you're going up and down scales and the like, you know. The thing with those, they, they definitely work, they function, but they can be kind of, I guess in a way, they're not musically fulfilling. Whereas if you learn, you know, the head's got to match by your career, uh, not only is that going to stretch you technically if you want to play it up to speed, but it's also musically complete as well. So we're, we're also working on other aspects of our playing. Now, of course, you could, if you wish, and I guess this is the ultimate here, you could compose your own pieces. So I've got a couple of things that I've written and recorded that would sort of on the edge of what I was capable of playing. In fact, if anything, just beyond the edge of what I was capable of playing. So the very nature of the fact that I've written this part and I needed to record it and perform it has meant that I've had to stretch my technique to be able to do so. So you may find that if you can't find like the perfect thing out there from someone else's music, then you have to start composing these things yourself, which is actually a really, really good thing. The advantage, of course, of playing things from the sort of the canon of whatever genre of music that you're working on is that something that you might find particularly easy or will have uh, or areas that you might find tricky, well, they might be the areas that are being stretched in this other piece that's written by someone else, say. So for a couple of years, I used Frank Ambali's Chop Builder uh, for warm-ups and exercises for no other reason than I just wanted a break from inventing these things myself. And I thought, well, it'd be good to see what someone else uses you know, in this instance. And in a way, the beauty of that is you, you can kind of uh, rest the creative side of your uh, imagination in a way. You don't necessarily have to be imaginative. You just kind of play what's already out there. The thing about it is, though, if you do create these things yourself, then you know what you need to, to know more than anyone else. So you might get lucky and someone else might devise a whole workout of things to, uh, to practice that just happens by accident to hit all the areas that you need to work on. But much better if you design this yourself. The, the other thing I've found with this is you need to keep mixing it up. It's like any kind of, I guess, like an exercise plan. You do the same thing all the time you're going to get bored of it, you know, and then you're probably going to commit to it less and do, do it less often. So I've got kind of a, a vocabulary and repertoire of these kind of pieces that I draw from. So if I want to practice technique today, I'll just pull any one of them out the bag and go, OK, well, I'm going to practice, I don't know, some Charlie Parker thing, Blues for Alice, shall we say. And that's going to be my technique. That's my chops workout for today. Or I'm going to work on... Django's Waltz, or I've got a piece myself called Friday's Tune, which is in five, and it's fast and it's tricky. I might play that. A, it's fun. B, it's musical. C, it's working on my chops and keeping on top of my technique. So that's my thoughts there. 
something that you could do is uh, create a little hit list of things that you've always wanted to learn to play. And even if you know you break it into a hundred sections and you, you approach it over an extended period of time, so long as you get there in the end, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get this done. Everything seems to have gone quiet next door, so I'm going to take a chance and see if I can get through this without a drill going off. So wish me luck. Okay, so Francesco sent me a question about uh, playing faster lines. So I thought I'd share some of my tips about playing quicker stuff. So let's begin uh, with a phrase that's very similar to what we've just looked at with the Pat Martino ideas, but to over, extend it over a greater range. Right? So play this a little bit slow to begin with. So here's, this is going to be in uh, the tonality of B minor Dorian. And the phrase will be... phrase okay so slow so it's common from B Dorian but it's got some chromaticism in there but let's just take the very first section of that just that part Now there was a time that I considered uh, incorrectly that there was only really two types of guitar players. There was players that would pick everything, and the players that were more legato, that would just hammer and pull. Uh, so, and you were either one or the other. And I think I was definitely a, a hammer and pull guy rather than a pick everything guy. And that was kind of fine when I was playing electric guitar with overdrive, although I was always really, really fussy about tone if I didn't have quite the right amount of compression or the right amount of gain it made things really really difficult then I made the transition to playing more acoustic based styles and styles where you play with a cleaner tone and realized that all this legato stuff just doesn't work or didn't work for me uh, the notes didn't have enough projection there wasn't enough push on the sound I couldn't really make things speak so I had to really revisit my picking technique and then I watched the video John Schofield at one point, uh, the one where he's given a masterclass listing the scales and modes that he uses and so on. Really, really great, a fantastic uh, thing. And that would have probably been about 17 or 18 years of age when I saw that, 18 maybe perhaps. And, uh, and he talks about it where he says he's got terrible picking technique. So what he's done is he's found a way of making hammer-ons and pull-offs work. And for me, that was an absolute revelation that you don't need to pick every note but also, you're not so legato-based that you're hardly picking any notes. It was kind of in the middle. And the more I explored this, the more I realized that's what so many great players are doing. That's what Pat Matheny's doing. That's what Paul Gilbert's doing. You know, that's what Yngwie Malmsteen's doing a lot of the time. A lot of these players, they're not picking every single note. When you look really, really carefully, you notice they're not picking every note. So now I've kind of consolidated this into a number of different approaches. So well, if I were to play this line, let's play the first part again. So it bounces. And the notes hopefully project. But it's not all picked. So I'm going to slow it down and hope that I don't do it differently because what tends to happen with this now is I don't really think so much and I just pick the notes that I want to pick. But the first concept is the idea of picking some or most of the notes, not necessarily all of them. So it's going to be pick, 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 pull. Actually, there's a pull. Pick, pick, pull, pick, 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 pull. So I'm going pick, pick. Pick's actually going da 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 These are the ones that have been picked. They're the only ones being picked. So it's kind of like 
my analogy for this. It would be like an upturned bicycle and you want to spin the wheel as fast as you can. Okay, legato players just give the wheel one almighty great push and then the rest of it goes on with momentum. Alternate pickers to me feel like they've got the wheel in their hand and they're moving it around as fast as they can. Whereas my approach is to be just pushing the wheel around, picking whenever I feel like to keep the wheel spinning. That's how I approach this and that's how I see it. Now, if I were to give this a kind of a system, if that were possible, the idea is it's either to do with creating rhythmic bounces or it's to do with giving yourself some freedom when you need freedom, meaning it's the penultimate note is usually where we need a hammer on. So if I were to pick, say for argument's sake, the same tonality, three notes per string, say I was going. My picking for this would be pick, pick, pull, pick, pick, pull, pick, pick, pull. So it's the penultimate note. Off happens so rather than being or which is not got enough push one feels tight stiff the other one's too loose this is in the middle okay so there I'll do this so imagine I'm gonna do just for argument's sake I'm gonna go yeah, everyone knows some kind of exercise like this my way of playing this will be to go pick 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 Pull, pick, 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 pull. Okay, does that make sense? I hope that's making sense. So it's picking most of the notes. Now sometimes, right there, to get a bounce, I'm including legato within a single string. Now that's an optional thing. usually when it's tying in with um, like a grace note type uh, dynamic idea where, where I don't necessarily want all the notes to be the same volume uh, so it's not really a grace note sorry it's more of a dynamic idea that so this concept of where you put the hammer-ons then that's something that you can consider with each and every phrase but in terms of as a system Right, really, what we're doing here, my take on this, and I think the take that John Schofield, although it's not super precise, right, because obviously he's not just playing uh, symmetrical patterns all the time, is it's based around the idea of picking the notes, so say we did B Dorian, until there's going to be a string change. So it will be pick, pick, hammer, pick. Now you could pick that one. Pick, pick, or pick, hammer, pick, pick, hammer, pick. based approach one might associate more with rock guitar is something that I like to think of as a four in six picking pattern okay so if we take something like three notes on a string I'll keep it in the same tonality okay what I can do is I can play say three legato notes pick hammer hammer followed by three pick notes so it's kind of a form of alternate picking but with a gap and that little micro rest is what allows your stamina your muscles to uh, to recover and the stamina to keep these things moving around. So let's do this really slowly. So the, the motion here will be pick. Pick, 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 pick. Pick, 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 pick. So the pick's gone. And the hammer-on's in the gaps. So you could put that through the typical Aldemiola, Paul Gilbert exercise, pick, 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 pick. Those kind of things. Or you could put it across, say, two strings, like. snap 
Chapman type of approach. There's also an idea you can use in Gypsy Jazz where you play the first and third. Not dissimilar to uh, the this kind of idea. Those kind of things. So that's a concept of uh, almost like the ride cymbal type. So to recap here, all of these approaches are based around the concept of picking some, but not all of the notes. So rather than the way I used to mistakenly think it, imagine this kind of bridge and on one side you've got Mike Stern and John McLaughlin, and on the other side you've got Scott Henderson and uh, Alan Holdsworth, you know, lots of picking, not so much picking. I'm now realized that I'm somewhere in the middle, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, and for me, that's a better place to be because I've always felt when I picked every note, it felt tight and stiff. And when I played everything legato, I didn't get enough projection, particularly on acoustic guitar. There's a reason why I've picked this guitar today because I didn't want you to feel uh, as if these things are specific to you know electric guitar, you do this, on acoustic, you do that. I thought, well, I'll take that out of the equation and demonstrate these things on a nylon string guitar. But I'm hoping if you explore this, what we might call in the middle ground of picking, in between every note being picked and every note being hammered, you might find your place. And for me, this is what allows me, rather like John Schofield, to play things you know, at a level of speed that's acceptable and, you know, and kind of keep up with the super pickers, if you like. In a way, so much so that you know, other guitar players maybe care about this stuff. Other musicians in the band, they don't really care what technique you're using as long as you can make the notes come out and you can play with projection and you can play with articulation and you can allow the notes to speak. So that's the way that I choose to do these things when I'm picking. Almost never do I pick every single note. Almost never do I hammer every single note. And this also, uh, this is just for the purposes of clarity here and, uh, and so I can focus on this area. I'm excluding here things like hybrid picking, which is also another big part of my style. That could be something we could look at in future weeks. So I hope that's helpful. Before we close today, let me play some of those exercises one more time. But I want you to get a really good close up on the picking hand. I'm aware of the fact that you couldn't really see the picking hand for some of those examples there. Okay, so let me play, I'm gonna play them super slow for you. Okay, so the first one was like this, that the, the uh, lick based exercise that was Da, 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 da. Pick, 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 pick. Everything else is a pull off or a hammer on. Pick, 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 There. So that's right up to the to the line. Pull, pull, and that's how I get bounce into lines. I it's the slides and the hammer ons that give that the bounce rather than it sounding stiff. Anyway, I've talked about that at length in the main body. I want to just use this as an opportunity so that you can see the actual picking motion. Okay, now for the more rock-based ideas, I hope you can see this. It's down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And of course you could also... More palm-muted things if you're playing more like electric guitar or if you like the Aldi Miola type sound. Pick, 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 pick. Or across two strings, pick. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay. 
the gypsy jazz things that I played, I think I played down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, with the middle notes. Down, up, down. So it's actually catching that on a down. Down, up, down. Down, up, down. Down, up, down. That kind of thing. So I hope that helps. You can see that really closely there. So first one. Second idea. Okay. Thanks once again for joining me for another one of these Q&A sessions. It means a lot that you've got this far. Uh, as always, the comments uh, and messages are really appreciated. So please keep them coming. If you've got any requests for tunes that you'd like me to have a go at playing uh, or any particular topics or ideas that you think that would be useful for us to look at, then please do get in touch. As always, take care of yourself, stay safe, and I'll see you next week for number 37.